Hey guys, this is Ernest James, host of the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast. And I got a question to ask you. Could you buy me a cheeseburger? Better yet, could you buy me a value meal? Yes? Well, guess what? I don't need a value meal. However, for the cost of a value meal, you can support this podcast to keep us on the air. Just go to Patreon slash Deal to Heal podcast and choose any one of the three tiers that's available. And if you just want to make a one-time donation, go to Cash App and make a donation to dollar sign E. James, the number 418, make a one-time donation to the Cash App, or again, go to Patreon to support this podcast and keep us on the air. Thanks in advance. Be blessed. Welcome to Deal to Heal with E. James Podcast. On this podcast, my guest and I will discuss topics and ways to help us to heal in every area of our lives. I believe that everyone can live a life that is happy, healthy, and whole. So I'm on a mission to help people to deal, heal, and fulfill. Deal with your problem, heal from the pain, and fulfill your purpose. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast. I am your host, Ernest James, and I am on a mission to help people to deal, heal, and fulfill, to deal with your problems, to heal from the pain, and to fulfill your purpose. Thank you all for tuning in. We are in uh, season number two, episode number 21. So we are just plugging away. Thank you guys for being here for following us this far and uh, tuning in to all our listeners. And thanks everyone that has been a guest up into this point and everyone that has supported me so far. And tonight, like just like any other night, we are here with our another, another guest who I'm proud to uh, have on. Ms. Bean, how are you doing? Bean. I- I am well. <laughs> That's all right, Ernest. You know, I, I mess up your first name and didn't mess up your last name too. <laughs> oh, you know, Miss Ben is the easiest route to go. <laughs> I am well. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. I'm really excited about a chance to chat with you. No doubt, no doubt. And I thank you very much. First of all, let me say thank you for taking out your time uh, to be on the platform, to be on the um on the podcast because you could be doing anything else and definitely as a as a mother i know you have plenty other things to do <laughs> but you took out your time to be here with me tonight and so i definitely appreciate it and i'm sure that my listeners would appreciate it as well awesome. um so let's just jump right in so for starters uh tell us what it is that you do um just introduce yourself to, to the listeners All right. All right. Well, I am a children's book author and the children's book that I wrote is Little Mr. Fix-It Assists with the To-Do List. It runs more like an e-commerce platform business, the way that ecosystem exists around the book. There's a complimentary line of stationery that goes with the book and there's a whole consciousness around helping encourage parents to spend more time together. Mm-hmm. early literacy, of course, and also making it fun to enjoy learning and reading together. The other thing that I do when I'm not promoting my children's book is coaching and podcasting. Like you, I'm a uh-huh. fellow podcaster, and my podcast is quite simply called the Children's Book Marketing Podcast. It's to help make marketing easier for children's book authors. And with that, I spend a lot of time on Instagram communicating with authors who need better ways to position the work that we do to help build diversity into bookshelves of homes, not just like the ones that we live in, but also the ones that exist across the country. And I have a lot of fun on TikTok in the book space. So you won't find the same exact content in both places, but I really enjoy being a content creator and it is to me one of the best ways to express creativity in a variety of ways so that's video that's creating not just things for myself but also for my clients and when i'm not doing that 
I'm hanging out in the motherhood. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. I, I, I'm, I'm still kind of get. I've, I've been on, on social media uh, for a little while. Um, definitely now that I have the podcast, I'm, I'm a little more into it. I'm trying to get into TikTok. Um, my, my thing with TikTok is just finding a way to do some of the things that they do on there, but still have it in line with, you know, what I represent, you know, yeah. on, on TikTok. So I'm still trying to figure it out, but I know sooner or later I'll, I'll figure something out. You know, I see definitely all the things that you have on there and the, and the way that you uh, incorporate it, you know, so I'm definitely taking notes. I'm taking notes, you know, <laughs> trying to learn. It's, it's good to, to find your groove on there, but since you're kind of new to the platform, just hang out for a bit and see what pulls you. It's one thing when you force something into TikTok and it's not truly who you are, but when you get to be able to establish your authentic voice, you see the dynamics that can work in your favor and you've got an amazing community of fathers and families so there are lots of things to speak to in that area of expertise now i will warn you about family you're gonna hear mine <laughs> and you may be tempted to think it's more than one child but it's just the one <laughs> okay okay speaking of which so I, I've seen on one of your uh, one of your TikToks, speaking mm -hmm. of TikTok also, that you talked about uh, the birth of your. Well, you talked about getting pregnant with your son, yeah, and you know that whole journey. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you that with with that. First of all, could you tell us a little bit about that experience, and then how did that experience uh, inspire you to? Write. I don't know if you're already writing children books, but uh, maybe even in the the book of Mister Fix It, how did that experience inspire you to, you know, write that if you had not already wrote it? Yeah, you know, this is a really good question, and the experience was for me life changing. When I first got pregnant, of course, the whole shock of it. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't quite there because we had been trying. We were actively in the attempts to mm -hmm. start a family together. And there was one key thing that neither of us knew when we were trying. And it's that there was a genetic disposition between the two of us where me having beta thalassemia, which is a blood disorder, Similar to anemia, but not quite. It mm -hmm. means that I essentially don't create enough beta in the blood. And the blood is made of alpha and beta. So I don't create enough beta. But when you combine that with someone who has sickle cell trait, there is a strong chance that the child can have sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. And the experience where you've got on the one hand, you've got this huge high because you're excited. And of course, we were grateful. However, what my concerns were, were that we would have a child who would be riddled with a disease that is unpredictable, uncontrollable, and incurable. So there was a lot of rain, mm -hmm. a lot of tears, and a lot of testing. And we really didn't have that first trimester to get fully excited because we needed to know what the outcome would be. And so right. thank God there's testing available to reveal what the genetic disposition would be. And fortunately, our son was born without sickle cell traits or oh, sickle cell disease at all. He inherited my gene, which means that he's functional and he can live a normal life, but there will be times that he's often more fatigued and there were times when his body temperature regulation is not what it would be if there were no issue with beta thalassemia, but it's otherwise very much livable. So we were grateful for that. <laughs> right, right, right. Now I, I definitely, uh, you know, thank God for that blessing. Um, me being a, a father myself, uh, I only have one biological child, mm -hmm. uh, which is my daughter. And got a little man right there. Hey there. there <laughs> Almost like you. Call them on cue. Mason, yes, you can say hello. 
Hello. <laughs> hey, Mason, right. how you doing? We done Mason. talked him up, huh? <laughs> yeah, talked him up. Okay, now, Mason, yeah. we're having a conversation about stuff that mommies and daddies talk about. Would you mind finding something fun to do? No. No, you don't want to? Okay, well, if you sit here with mama, you have to be very quiet, okay? Why? Because he needs to hear me, and we would like to make sure I can hear him too, okay? Okay. Okay. All right. So you're going to be quiet? No. No. All right. Well, how about you grab that? No. And you take that someplace where you want to go hang out. Would that be okay? No, I would stay here with me. All right. You can stay here with me if you sit in the chair and be very quiet, okay? Okay, you can be quiet right there for now. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. And, and, Welcome to and, my world. <laughs> I, I hope you don't mind, but I'm not editing it out. <laughs> I don't mind at all. You know, sometimes people crack me up. They say when they watch me go live, like, oh, I really enjoyed what you were talking about, but I was really hoping Mason would show up. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I'm glad that he did. I'm glad that he did. And I love especially when when I'm speaking to someone whose whose platform uh, uh, involves family. I'm I'm never, you know, against when family show up, you know, it's like, hey, there we go. That's because that's what we're about anyway. We are. You know, so I, I definitely especially with, with with your whole story and him and how that you know, plays a part even with your, your writing and everything. Yeah. So, hey, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Hey, Mason, glad you could join us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the interesting thing about it is I was not reading children's books prior to Mason being born. Prior to him, I was like the only friend of mine who didn't have any kids. And mm. because I waited until the later part of my career to begin family planning, it was to my benefit, I feel, because I got a lot of things done that having a child would have altered in a way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how I would have managed, but I quit my job when he was here because I didn't see a need to go any further in that path. There was inspiration that came about there was creativity there were things that i thought of differently suddenly because i was a part of right. the parenthood and i couldn't ignore those things and so most of the inspiration for me writing children's books comes from being the mother of a black son who has desires and interests and his little personality is what yes Okay, his little personality is what, here, take this with you. There you go. His little personality is what really helped me to see that there were things that I should be more attentive to in the home life, in the home environment mm -hmm. that I could finally commit to making the time to do without having a full-time job in the corporate sense. Right. Okay, and, and you know, that's... That's why I, I love, again, like I said, when, when we're talking about family and, and family shows up, I'm like, yeah, yeah, we got to leave that in there. You know? <laughs> and, and I've heard different podcasts. Uh, uh, actually, more recently, I was listening to a podcast and uh, it was fathers. You know, fathers were talking and you could hear the kids in the background and everything. And it's kind of like, you know, it didn't bother me. Yeah. But I just had that thought, like, you know, some people may be like, hey, you need to edit that out. It's too much going on in the background. But I'm like, hey, if we're having a conversation about fathers, what right. more part of it is to be in the environment where you're a father, in the environment of, of your family and in the environment um, of, of your children. And I just think that's uh, that's a blessing. Um, and okay. what I was saying um, before Mason popped up. <laughs> Um, with my daughter, uh, I have one uh, biological child and I have uh, one bio biological child, which is my mm -hmm. daughter, mm -hmm. and I have four stepsons. And uh, when my daughter was born, I remember them uh, telling us that it was a chance that she could have, I think it was sick, uh, sick of cell, you know, uh, when we when we were um, expecting her. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but fortunately also for us, she was born, you know, healthy and, and she just made, well, we didn't 
She just made 18 last year, graduated from high school. She's starting college soon, she's working, and so she, she's doing great. So, you know, I definitely, um, I'm definitely great, uh, not great, grateful mm -hmm. about that because that's a blessing because one of the other things that I do um, besides podcasting and working, I work in home health care. And I work with people with disabilities and things like that. So I see the challenges um, that comes along with families that, you know, have children that, you know, uh, need extra help, yeah. you know. And so um, I'm definitely grateful uh, for, you know, my blessing of a, of a healthy child and, and also for you too. Yes, so, praise um, God for that. I'm so glad to hear that she did not have sickle cell. Unfortunately, there are advancements being made in medicine to help families manage it. But um, whenever people ask me if we'll have more children, part of the reason the answer is no is because I didn't get sick the entire pregnancy. I didn't have any issues with biology other than that terrifying four month time span. That's what I don't want to repeat. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then that's <laughs> that's understandable. So I, I heard you say that you were in corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, you were working in corporate before Mason was born. Were you still writing at that time, or was the whole writing books uh, or anything like that was didn't come to after Mason? It didn't come until after Mason. Strangely enough, there were so many things that came my way while I was pregnant. Please don't go in there, Mason. There's nothing in the closet for you, sweet love. There's a vacuum, and that's about it. <laughs> there were so many things that creatively came my way, and I did not have the I did not have the capacity to do all of the things that got put into my atmosphere. So I started giving away business ideas to other people because it might fit something that they're currently interested in or something that might be something they would do really well at. And what I landed on with writing wasn't until well after Mason had been here. And that was really more because of the pandemic than anything else. I saw an opportunity to start talking about some of the disconnects that families have where it relates to diversity, where it relates to understanding what happens culturally in a household that looks nothing like theirs. And it came about during the time that the George Floyd riots in Minneapolis kicked off and then found their way into other communities all across the world. It happened because it landed here in the Atlanta area near a rental property that I own. When a man was in the driveway, the drive through at a Wendy's restaurant, and he was unfortunately killed by the police on his way home, decided he was going to stop and get something to eat, fell asleep, woke up, it was a whole crazy situation there. That made national headline news. Then there was the issue with Ahmaud um, uh, Aubrey coming to light around that same time when it seemed like all these things kept happening back to back. I had to say something. And part of what really drove me was that there can't be a way that humanity is okay with this. What are people learning? What are people seeing? Why do people think these things about us? was what I wanted to know. What are people's kids hearing that helps them to understand more of what things should be happening and what shouldn't be happening? And uh, I just took it as an opportunity to use my words to help reach the youngest generation of them all through the generation that most directly influences them, which is through their parents. Mm. Okay. So, uh so one of my questions, one of my questions, because <laughs> I know you mentioned about uh, promoting cultural uh, diversity in, in literature. And mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that's important for, for several reasons. Um, for one, to promote reading, uh, first of all, uh, as a whole for, for everybody, but definitely in, in our culture, 
Um, because just taking it in, in my own personal life, my, my dad and my mom uh, were both big on education. Mm -hmm. And so we were always uh, prompted to read. So we had the two big uh, walk ceiling to floor bookcases in our in our dining room filled mm -hmm. with books. My mom um, was going to uh, be a lawyer at one time. So we had lawyer books. We had encyclopedias. We had all anything, any kind of book you could think of. We had. Yeah. You know, so we all grew up uh, uh, reading. And, you know, and when I was younger, we had the, I, I'm sure they don't even have it now, but they used to have a program called Book It. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, in connection with uh, Pizza Hut. And you would read these books and you would have to do like a little um, book report on it and you would turn it into your teacher. And mm -hmm. I did like, I think it was like three or four books, you know, whatever. They would give you a, a certificate for a free personal pizza. Nice. And so uh, it was it was nine of us uh, as far as kids. Mm -hmm. And we all love to read anyway. So we would all read and do these things and get these certificates for these uh, pizzas. So whenever we hit nine, my mm -hmm. parents would take us out and we would have a, a pizza night. So we have everybody have their little small individual pizza. And then they have, you know, we have two family size pizzas. And Sweet. so uh, reading and literature. And also my mom was a writer, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and that kind of went down from my grandmother down to the family, you know, a whole family of writers. Uh, some of us singers, I didn't get that part. <laughs> but I did get the writing part. So liter liter literature and reading and writing mm -hmm. was very uh, instrumental in my life and in the life of my family. So I definitely uh, connect with, you know, pushing the narrative of, of us you know, reading more just as a people, but then yeah. definitely in, in black households. And even yeah. more so with your book, with the Mr. Fix It, because is is if I'm not mistaken, it's a story of a son bonding with his father, yeah. you know? And so um, first of all, where did the concept for the story come from? The concept is really art imitating life. <laughs> so... I grew up as a child who was fortunate to have two men in our household because we lived in a two family house. My grandparents lived downstairs and my mom, my stepdad, my sister and I lived upstairs. And my grandfather was the first Mr. Fixit that I knew. He was the man that everybody called from church to members of the neighborhood and the community whenever they needed certain things done. And I grew up experiencing these trips to the hardware store with my grandfather. So to me, it is a natural progression of part of the story, experiencing that trip from realizing that you need some items for supplies to going to the store. But then my stepdad was the same way. And Mason's dad is that way. And some of the projects that are done in the story are directly taken from experiences that were shared between Mason and his dad. I actually have photos that I was able to provide to my illustrator to make it possible for her to use her creativity to adapt what she saw in the images into what she would be able to develop as the characters. So that's what inspired it. The, the thing about seeing a father and a son, part of the onset of all the political and social unrest and all the targets against Black men were birth what led me to bring this into father-son space. Because we got fathers that I mentioned who didn't make it home to their kids, mm -hmm. who expected to. Or in the case with Ahmaud Aubrey, he didn't even get a chance to become a father. And so there are children who look for someone in their life to be that individual, that inspiration. And they're, they may not have it as a result of somebody approaching situations with fear when really what should be shown is empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. And so the emotional appeal for this story, if you look at like the cover, the cover is this doting father looking at his son and they're spending this time together. Well, guess what? Whatever the, the circumstances are between a man and 
whoever is the person that's accosting him, let's just be understanding of something. There are people who look up to that man. There are people mm -hmm. who care about that man. There are people who are expecting to see that man when they cross the graduation stage. And the opportunity to do so shouldn't be as much of a, a privilege as a given. Mm -hmm. So all of those things combining and me seeing Mason grow into a three-year-old <laughs> who was curious and always wants to follow his father and help either mm -hmm. his father or B was really what all came together to make this story what it is. Yeah, that's what did yeah. it. Now, I'll tell you a funny thing about the book. Because of the age that Mason was when I started to write this, I incorporated some of the things that he was learning. And he's still learning. Mm -hmm. And I've always been someone who writes, whether it's journaling or short essays. I've always written well. And I value that art, that expression. So when he started writing on the walls, because he was curious about <laughs> how he could look on paint, <laughs> I gave him an outlet that would help to weave into the story different elements of childhood development and that you'll see parts of kids learning come apart into the story too. So you've got a line of stationery where little Mr. Fixit and his dad are going through a to-do list the entire time in the story. And if you're a guy who likes to fix stuff, you are always carrying some kind of a notebook because you have to mm -hmm. write down your measurements and you have to write down all of the things that you need to pick up from the store. And the little guy on the cover is holding on to one of these. So it gave me a way to say, here's a way for you to spend time together. Here's a way for kids to learn and become confident with this new skill. And so that they don't have to write on your walls and your lampshades and wherever else they can apply marker. Right. Give them some place that they can be who they are becoming and do so with it in mind that they're continuing to learn. You know, and, and, and I love that because that was a big part of my growing up also, because my dad was a mechanic. Really? And so one of the things that he would have us do occasionally, he would have us come out in the garage with him, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sometimes he needed us, you know, to help him do different things because like the trans changing the trance and you have to get up under the car. It's like, okay, you <laughs> I need to drag it up while I put it in place, you know, things like that. Right. But those days of, uh, even when it's not necessarily uh, intentional as far as I'm going to teach you this today, mm -hmm. but the act of being there and he says, hand me that screwdriver or hand me the, the flathead screwdriver. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, which one is a flathead? You mm -hmm. know, but then in that moment, learning the difference between a flathead screwdriver and a Phillips screwdriver, yeah. you know, in, in those moments. And I remember my dad growing up and he always told us, I'm not going to force you to be, you know, what I want you to be or what I am, you mm -hmm. know, but you're going to be something, yeah. you know. And so one of the things he would always, you know, like I say, you ha have us come into the garage and we have those moments where, you know, he's doing different things and we're handing him tools or whatever, mm -hmm. or he's changing something out and, and we have to, you know, help him in some, some yeah. type of way. And those moments, you know, of, of having with your father. And that's why I really connected with even the storyline of the book, you know, uh, because it it touches so many facets, you know, uh, of, of fatherhood, number one, of black fatherhood, number two. And then just in the connection and being able to, to see us, you know, in a different light, yeah. you know, and to, to humanize us, like you said, you know, when you look at the at the front of the cover, it's a father and a son. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And with the images that we see so often, that's how we are portrayed. Like you said, is that was what bring those questions. Like you asked earlier, that people from different cultures, like what are what are their children learning about us? Right. You know what I mean? If they don't have uh, a daily 
you know, interaction with us because there are some parts of, you know, the world, the city, the states where we're not represented. Right. You know what I mean? And so the only representation that they have of us is what they see in the media. So that's why I really connected with, you know, with the story and, you know, for different reasons, those three reasons, of course. And also it was called Little Miss Fix It and I'm in construction. So I'm like, all right, you know, that's, you know, in that vein, like, yeah, let's fix something, which was a, a gift that I inherited. I don't know, I guess I could say from my, from my dad. Uh, from an early age, and mm-hmm. I talked about this before. Uh, I think it was on, it may be on, on my podcast or somewhere else. I remember my earliest stage of building something. I built a go kart, right? Mm-hmm. I built a go kart with old wagon wheel parts <laughs> and wood. You know, I had wood and everything, and I remember building it. And I was really young. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to say I was maybe like ten. I don't even remember. I know I was young. And thinking back on it as an adult, I'm like, I don't even know how I knew how to do it. Because I did it by myself. <laughs> and it was functional. Like, it, I put the wow. wheels on, you know, the whole thing. And I think back now, and I'm like, I don't even know how I knew how to do it. I don't even know how I knew what the tools to use. Good you question. Know? But I just, I just knew. You know, you just so, probably picked up a lot more being in the garage with your dad than you were aware yeah. That's something else I think is really important to know. There's there's lots of things that kids that age range of like three to six, they're learning lots of things. And some of the, the professions that they're being led toward are being introduced to them. And one of the things that I don't want to do is discredit blue collar. Mm-hmm. Everybody does not want to go to college and become a physician or an engineer, even if they are interested in fixing things. And one of the things I felt was important to include in this experience is that Mr. Jefferson is intentionally a blue collar dressed man. We don't know if Mr. Jefferson runs his own business. Mm -hmm. We don't know if Mr. Jefferson is a contractor or a skilled tradesman. We don't know if he's the person that's on the road delivering goods trucked across the country. And the reason I left him ambiguous is because I want there to be some celebration of these roles that are men who have decided they want to do it their way Mm -hmm. and that they don't necessarily need to fit into the upper structure of academic achievement in order for them to be satisfied with their life. Right. And I think too, people have asked me, you know, what what more about Mr. Jefferson? Who is he based on? He's based on a, a number of people. I mentioned my grandfather and my stepfather and, and Mason's dad, but I believe he's somebody that other people can see someone they know as well. And oh yeah. He reminds me of somebody else because he's a similar complexion. Or I remember going to see my uncle and this is who he reminds me of. And I wanted him to be relatable. I didn't want him to be caricatured. So Mm -hmm. the illustrations were done by someone who's a portrait illustrator so that she could really make the characters somebody that you might you might see when you're walking down the street and think he looks just like the cover character that I have on this book at home. That's important. And it is really validating when I hear kids who have seen this and they say, that's their dad. And that's them, the little guy on the cover. That right there, Ernest, if nobody ever gives this book an award, and I'm not in it for that, (laughs) the reward that I get from having that sense of acknowledgement where little boys see parts of themselves and their fathers in this story, my work is done. Mm. done. You know, and I'm one of the things that, that you said that I'm I'm glad to hear because I, I identify with it also is that blue collar worker, right? So I'm myself, I am a 
uh, Union Bricklayer, right? I knew, like I said, when I was young and I was building stuff, I knew I wanted to be in construction from young. Mm -hmm. How I knew, I don't know how I knew, I just knew, right? And I remember when I got in eighth grade, uh, one of our assignments was, you know, what do you want to be? Mm -hmm. you know when you grow up and so we had to do a you know thing of uh what we what job did we want so i already knew i'm like i'm going to be in construction some kind of way and so as i went and started looking into different uh jobs in construction i came across bricklayer and i was like that's what i want to do and that was it you know but one of the things that i i learned uh even going through that process so mind you that was in eighth grade i didn't actually become a bricklayer till I was like 25 uh, or a junior bricklayer mm -hmm. because of the knowledge that I was missing. So I went through high school, mind you, on a road student, very smart. And I remember talking to uh, one of my counselors who was a black counselor. And he was like, uh, one of the things that he pushed was going to college. You know, you should go to college. You got the grades or whatever. I'm like, I don't want to go to college mm -hmm. because that's not my dream. Like, you know, I, I want to build stuff. I love working with my hands and there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. you know, and not saying that he was wrong and, you know, advising me to take that road, but that's not everybody's road, yes. you know? And I remember even one of my first jobs that I applied for when I started working uh, was to be a garbage man. Right. And at that time, they was making like 10, 15 dollars an hour. You know, I was young and I was like, that's good money, you know, but just an everyday guy working with my hands, you know, doing that was like my whole mindset. Yeah. And so with me not having the uh, information that I needed to on which road to take or which route to take mm -hmm. to become a, a bricklayer, I went to college. I was taking college classes and, and construction and carpentry and all of that. Which that was fine. But what I found out later, I found about the union, I found out about apprenticeships. Yeah. And I'm like, you mean they will pay for me to go to college? You know, you mean I didn't have to pay for that? You yeah. mean they teach me and pay for me to go to school at the same time? You know, but it was that that knowledge that I wasn't given. Mm -hmm. And it could have been, you know, because of where I was from. It could have been because, you know, that's our area wasn't you know, told those things or our yeah. culture wasn't told those things. And those things weren't uh, introduced to our, you know, community and introduced into our neighborhood. So when mm -hmm. I became a, a union bricklayer, I connected with one of the um, organizations uh, that we were connected to. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, is they, they made these uh, books that had all the union trades in it, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm like, all right, give me as, as many copies of that book as you can. And so the guy gave me like two boxes. And so I made it my mission whenever I came across a young black man or a young black boy, hey, this is an option. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's an option. To, everybody's not going to college, not because they can't, but they just don't want to. I didn't want to. Yeah. And the only reason that I really went, because that's the only way I knew to get to where I was trying to go to. Like, all right, I got to get into construction. Let me go to college and take construction classes. Mm -hmm. But had I known about the unions and the opportunities that was there as a blue collar worker to still make decent money. Yeah. And probably even more than some of the, uh, well, I ain't gonna say probably, I know that part. <laughs> I know <laughs> right, that I make more now than some people with college degrees, yeah. you know, and I do have a college degree too, just to throw that out there. But you know, that opportunity and so yeah. i made it uh made it part of my thing to whenever i come across you know young guys I, hey look this is an outlet this is another opportunity maybe you don't want to go to college you know uh, but there are things that you can do yes. and there are trades that you can learn that you can work with your hands and mm -hmm. if you decide that if you don't want to work for this company no more you can start your own company you yeah. know, just by working with your hands and building your own, you know, your own thing. And um, that's definitely was one of the things that I learned from my dad, just being a mechanic, because he worked outside of outside of our own, you know, his own garage at our house, you know. And so yeah. it's, it's that being exposed to that, being mm -hmm. exposed to entrepreneurship, being exposed to, you know, what we can achieve, you know, outside of the norm or outside of you know, what we've been, been fed. So I'm, yeah. I, that was one of the things that I really liked it about, you know, the book uh, from that 
part of it. It's Thank like, you. yeah, the dad is his, his, like I said, I, I identify with it right away because I'm like, I'm, that's me and my dad. Like you said, when a, when a little boy look at that, that's me and my dad in the garage, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Saying, Hey, hand me, hand me the wrench or hand me the whatever. Yeah. You know, I remember those days. And, and like you said, maybe when I was, when I mentioned about how I knew how to do stuff that I didn't even know how, mm -hmm. that I knew, yeah. maybe again, those moments was teaching me more than I even knew that I was being taught at yeah. that same time. And I, I, I know that your books would do the same thing, you yeah. know, with those that read it, they are learning those same lessons and getting those same lessons that I got physically. Mm -hmm. They're getting them through literature. Thanks to, you know, the work that you do. That's the goal. That's the goal. Thank you so much for acknowledging that and pointing out too that there's almost a, a resurgence of our generation moving forward that's very different from what our parents were telling us and what our parents were experiencing when they were our age. For mm -hmm. instance, we were a part of the product of parents who integrated schools. And so the goal was to achieve equality to our parents, right? They're wanted their want for us was to get some of the things that they may not have had access to. So the go to college conversations were now that we finally can, you should. Mm -hmm. Only previous to that, our grandparents were skilled tradespeople. And they were in skilled trades because they couldn't get into college. Many of the, the finances weren't in place in households and the opportunity with the desegregation integration, all of that made it not even a desirable place to be <laughs> for mm -hmm. a lot of our grandparents. And they're like, I don't want to deal with that. But now we've lived enough to see what happens when you experience that university level, that college experience and come out on the other side of it. And we're returning to having your own through mm -hmm. your skills, building your own with your skills and becoming business owners in the areas of our skilled expertise. And right. there's like this, this jump in the children's book genre that goes from books about kids who should become acquainted with STEM learning so that they can ultimately what? Go to college, get a job. Mm -hmm. But I don't see, and it's not that I wrote this to be different. I wrote this because this is my reality. I don't see a whole lot of books explaining to kids that it's okay if you don't want to do that. It's okay right. if you want to take up something that you're interested in to participate in building wealth and generational accolades that you could pass on to your own legacy. Because let's just be real about this for a second. There aren't a lot of people outside of folks who look like us encouraging legacy building the wealth generation. Mm -hmm. So if we don't, who will? Yeah, and I, and I think it, it, so I'm gonna speak on that real quick. I think it's a, it's before now, um, I think it, it wasn't even, I think it wasn't thought, it wasn't a thought and it wasn't taught. It's, it's kind of twofold, That's you true. know, because coming from, those parents, or should I say those grandparents who worked hard with their hands, but it was because they couldn't get the education, yeah. right? Then you usher in the next generation who uh, have access to education. And so they run toward education, but they leave the skill that skills right. with the hands. Yeah. And so then we get into, uh, I would say my generation, this generation that we are now, and, and I was blessed to kind of have the best of both worlds in that sense, because mm -hmm. on my dad's side, my dad was a skilled with his hands. You know, he was a jet mechanic in the, in the service. He was an auto mechanic, you know, before he went to the service, then he mm -hmm. was auto mechanic coming back. My mom always definitely intelligent, writing books, going to, going to college to be a lawyer, you know? So I, we had the education and we had the physical labor under the same roof. And even to the point that uh, my parents even had a, a story at one time. So it's wow. entrepreneurship. It's like it's, I was under that umbrella where I had all of it. Yeah. And even with that, still, 
the the thought or being taught about the legacy part of it and wealth building it wasn't i don't even think that they thought about it you know what i mean i don't because part they wasn't exposed to it right you know but now me and the generation that i am uh, i'm in and what i'm learning i'm just learning it now really getting into you know the legacy building and you know not only to have a um business or something that you build but being able to leave it for the next generation and then yeah. being able to leave it in a in a state that it can go further than just their generation mm -hmm. you know and i think uh it's a it's a new it's a new era you know uh we definitely had a lot of things that went wrong in the pandemic a lot of loved ones lost i recently yeah. recently lost uh my grandmother you know, on my father's side. So it definitely was a lot of loss in the midst of the pandemic. So sorry but, to hear that, Ernest. Thank you. Um, but in the midst of that loss, there was so much growth and opportunity and so many doors that was open to allow us to see what was possible. Even yeah. with the limited, uh, ex the limited physical exposure, let me put it that way, because a lot of us was locked in our homes, we but were. since we were locked in our homes, we couldn't physically go out, but that allowed us the time to sit in front of the computers and really realize how much we can do on our own, yeah. you know, and I, I look at this whole movement that uh, has taken place, especially down in Atlanta, you know, with the different people and uh, different connections um that's going on and things that's being taught and the doors that's being opened and the opportunities that we have now that probably was there you know i ain't gonna say probably that was there all the time but we didn't know it because yeah. we were so busy chasing what was in front of us mm -hmm. that we didn't take time to see it so when everything shut down it's like okay we got to look for something new and so those uh advantages that taking advantage of that time to be able to look and see the things that's now, so now we can actually start having the conversation about wealth building and yeah. entrepreneurship and, you know, uh, you know, whether it's a uh, skill with your physical skill, with your hands or intellectual skill with writing or whatever that is. And, and mentioning that, because I know one of the things I wanted to talk to you about uh, was being a self publisher, you mm -hmm. know, that's all things that, you know, even that within itself, being a self-publisher, that's something you did on your own that, you know, before, probably before now, um, you know, some of those oh, ideas yeah, of being able to operate and because, move on your own. Since the rights, because uh, I only got five yeah, wives, yeah. I didn't got to the 100 or something. Excuse me, please. I'll take it. Thank you. We're not downloading any new games, wow. Mesa. Oh. Well, you play with one of the games that's no. on Mama's phone already. No. Okay. No, there's no space. There's no space. I want four games. Okay. Who would you want to phone with? Another. Okay. Do you want to talk to her again? No. Okay. Well, how about you go get your tablet now that my phone doesn't have any more space for you to add anything, and you play your math game. Oh, math. Hey, yes. I think that need the charger. Okay, go give it a charge. Mm -hmm. Go give it a charge. All right. I don't know what's funnier sometimes. His interruptions or my response to them. <laughs> may I have some of your water, please? Yes, you may have some of my water. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I should have I should have screenshotted that right there. Oh That's my goodness! Okay. <laughs> when you do your edits, <laughs> you can have that one. But we were talking about how with the pandemic and things that shift in Atlanta. I don't want to say self-publishing is something that's remarkably. Um, more remarkably more popular here than it is any place else. I didn't actually have the impetus to do it would it not been for this whole project. I didn't mm -hmm. have any intentions really on writing a book about children's issues and family issues. What I wanted to write was a book related to what I was doing before, which was in marketing and real estate. 
And although I did the pivot in a way that shut one thing off and picked one thing up, I very quickly learned what was involved with self-publishing because I asked a friend who had already published a book. She's in the Midwest, in Ohio. She's from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And she had already written a book. So I figured she knew. And as she was explaining it to me, it resonated the way project management does. And because I've spent a lot of time as a project manager in a branding product management world, it was like a direct correlation between what I was already accustomed to doing corporately that I left and picking this up to do something more to gain control of the marketing and the distribution. And I don't think that a lot of children's book authors or even self-published authors are aware of the process enough to feel confident that they can do it. But I do feel like it's something that could be easy to replicate once the system is in place. Right. So that, that it exists now is something that I've been able to leverage in a variety of ways. But knowing what I know now, Ernest, I wouldn't have gone about it any other way. And it's not just because of, and I, want, I don't want to oversimplify. It's not about the simplicity of it. It's about that, the control. Mm-hmm. It's about the autonomy. So we've all seen the five heartbeats. I mean, anybody who's in Generation X knows who Eddie Kane Jr. is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> when, if you recall, like movies like the five heartbeats, Cadillac Records, when you see some of the art that was created by us that was later adapted for the use of the mainstream. Mm-hmm. Well, that's something that still happens today. Yep. So I can almost guarantee that the character here, the brown that he is, would be asked to be lightened. Mm-hmm. The jargon, even though I'm not using any, for a children's book author that might write a book outside of the confines of proper grammar, mm-hmm. but do so on purpose, would be expected to change their language. And I'm not okay with a project that takes heart and soul being shelved because the intention to further our culture is being diminished by that lack of distribution or that lack of marketing support that would be done on part of a traditional publishing house. Knowing that exists, there's no way I can go traditional. Right. Yeah. And I, and I definitely appreciate that. Um, and, and it's funny that you mentioned the five hybrids. I actually just, I won a book, um, the other day, uh, one of, one of the ladies that's, um, I'm connected with, she's a podcaster too, mm-hmm. and she was releasing her podcast. And <laughs> so she posted, her post was, she put, she put up the quote, uh, baby doll is happening. It's really happening. <laughs> said, if you can tell me where that movie is, where that what movie that line is from, yeah, I will send you a free copy of the book. And I was like, hey, I know that movie. You know what I mean? Backwards and flowers. <laughs> so I, I actually just received the book uh, in the mail today. Uh, wow. I talked to her and she sent it to me, and I got it. And you know, so yeah, that was that was a, a cool. But like you said, definitely, it's been going on for years and decades in this country definitely and, pro- and I'm sure outside of this country also and and it's not not limited to you know uh uh race or it's not limited to, to ne- necessarily culture but it's about those who are in control mm-hmm. and because they are in control they control they control the narrative yeah. and like you said is is one thing to you know you write a book about an african american family and it's like, you know, like you said, with your illustrations, like, yeah, it's it's still an African American family. Let's just make them a little lighter. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, no, that's that's not what we're doing here. You know what I mean? Like, we have to definitely be in control of our own narrative. We have to be in control of telling our own story and representing ourselves the way we are represented. Because too often we are represented in a way that's oftentimes over exaggerated mm-hmm. and it's not it's not over exaggerated to our benefit 
right. you know, is 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 over exaggerated to our, you know, to our demise. And like we mentioned earlier, when you have a a um, member of the population that does not come in contact with us on a daily basis, so their only um, are their only interaction with us comes through the media that is controlled and what is being, you know, patrolled, what is being portrayed to them, you know, then it's, it's no wonder why we still have some of the problems that we have. And definitely, we've, we've definitely made some, some, you know, some moving forward. There's definitely been some changes, but there is still some problems that we have that can be easily, easily, you know, changed around if those who control the narrative would only, you know, tell the stories correctly. Yes. You know, and so definitely why I applaud you for even seeing that and recognizing that and not only recognizing it, but taking the the position that no, I'm going to represent us the way how I see it, you yes. know, and the way that I want it to be received, because I, I, I definitely I appreciate it. Like I said, when I seen it, you know, it, it, it resonated with me on on different levels, you know, which we already talked about. But that's why. Automatically, I'm like, you know, when we uh, contacted each other and, and even mentioned about you being on, I'm like, definitely, because this <laughs> is me. You know what I mean? Like this, that little boy is me. Yeah. You know, and I remember having them them times, you know, sitting with my dad and you know working on stuff. And even now, I I, I just had my dad over the other day because something wrong with one of my vehicles. I'm like, hey. I'm gonna try to fix it myself. But <laughs> I want you to be here just in case I run into something, you know, and I don't know what's going on. So, right. yeah, so those those moments that start at that age, yeah. we still it still goes on as we get older. I'm 45 years old, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I just had this conversation with my dad this week, you know, and so I, I think that it's, <laughs> it's so important. And like I said, that's why I resonated so much with the story, yes. the whole idea. And I'm like, I, I definitely got to have you on because you are me. You know what I, I mean? Mason, Mason is me. And and I have a nephew named Mason, too. So we all in the family. You know I mean? <laughs> we are. We are. So I'm so definitely... thrilled that you directly related to it, even though as someone who's in our 40s, you still see it. That touches my heart in a way. I'm not going to cry because there's no crying in podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> but it just touches me in a way because it lets me know that you need it just as much as the kids do. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Yeah. And and my my takeaway from that, because I know myself, I was blessed, right? And oftentimes I, I talk to people because I was blessed to be raised in a two parent household, you know, and that's not everyone's reality. True. And even me being a, a stepdad to four young men, you know, I understand that there's a part that each one of us plays, you know, uh, in fatherhood and manhood, you know, whether we're raising our, our kids, whether we're helping to raise someone else's kids, whether it's our, uh, our nephews or, you know, the friends of our kids, mm -hmm. you know, there's a part that we all play. And just to understand that and, and try to stand in that space, you know, as a man with my head up and to be able to pass along some of the things that I was blessed to receive in my home. Yeah. to be able to take it outside of my home to represent it to those who may not come from that same home structure. And, you know, I definitely appreciate everything that you've done and everything that you are continuing to do because literature, oftentimes, uh, like art in general, whether it be music, movies or whatever, it can reach people in places that we physically cannot touch, yeah. you know? And so it's so important for us to be able to have someone like yourself that will take that instrument, whatever it is, and in your case, writing, and send that message out into the world. And we just pray that it reaches everyone that it needs to reach yes. and everyone that it's supposed to reach. And that the reach that you will have, you know, will far, not only far go past where you can physically reach, but will remain and go far in the time 
than you may even physically have, you know? And so when we even, when we talk about legacy, to be able to have something that outlives us, mm -hmm. that will be a benefit to hum humanity as an overall, you know, gain, uh, I, I think you have that. And I'm, I, again, I thank you for writing it. I thank you for sharing that story. And I definitely thank you for everything that you do because you are an inspiration to me. And I see myself in your book. And I know that those who are like me will also see themselves. And those who are not like me will see me when they read your books. And it definitely will do the job that you wanted it to do to begin to change our world. And I definitely appreciate you once again for being on and being uh, a guest on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your kind words, your thoughtfulness, and your openness with sharing how this book affects you. When I wrote it, I thought it was just for the fathers and the sons, but it's to uplift all of us. Mm hmm and to provide that sense of elevation is a great duty and honor that I embrace. So thank you. Thank you for having me on. And I will provide for your listeners, anyone who's interested in seeing what this book is about, <laughs> that we have been talking about this entire time, I will provide a link so that they can get a discount on the book. That way, if they want to check it out, just because they are a part of your listening audience, family, they can get it at a lower price than what they would be able to get it at if they were on the website. And I'll give you a link for that for your show notes. But if you mm -hmm. want me to also call it out, I can do that as well. So to hey, do, do however you feel. <laughs> All right. Well, it's just little Mr. Fix It dot com slash pages slash hc bogo 50. And okay that might that's be something hard to remember so i will make sure that's available to you okay cool cool and again we we thank you for being on uh one more time drop your um uh, social media handles where we can follow you and definitely uh support you in that way as well sure sure little mr fix it dot com is the website and I am on TikTok representing all things related to this author experience, early literacy, advocacy for diverse books and representation of Black families in children's literature. That TikTok is just my name, Michaela S. Like Simone Ben. And I'm also on Pinterest by the same name, doing the same thing, but with a little bit more in the areas of homeschool parenting the motherhood and entrepreneurship <laughs> in addition to and, and what's the um the podcast information oh the podcast that is quite simply the children's book marketing podcast it's on apple it's on spotify those are the two most watched places or most listened to places and i'm also with the podcast on google as well as amazon podcast Okay. And uh, YouTube as well, because I think I followed you on YouTube. Yes. Uh, today. Yes. Yeah. The so Children's Book you... Marketing Channel exists mm -hmm. on YouTube. <laughs> How could I forget okay. about that? <laughs> right. I did a little homework. I did a little homework. Yes, you did. <laughs> you got to applaud so you I, for I that. To... Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, they had every, you know, our listen, my listeners, I definitely appreciate them. And I wanted to make sure that they had every opportunity for whatever platform that you want to support you and what you do, because I definitely uh, believe in it. So uh, once again, thank you so very much for taking out uh, your time and taking Mason's time <laughs> <laughs> to spend some time with us. I definitely appreciate it. You guys, uh, all the listeners, I thank you guys for tuning in. Again, this is the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast, and I am on a mission to help people to deal, to heal, and to fulfill, to deal with your problems, to heal from the pain, and to feel your purpose. So until next time, we will see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hey guys, I know you're enjoying the podcast. However, don't forget to join our text line at 866-326-0730. That's 866-326-0730 in order to receive text messages with new events and things that is going on and new episodes as they release. 
All right. See you in a minute. Thanks for listening to the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast. Remember to listen, like, subscribe, and share. This episode has been brought to you by Deal to Heal Teas. Put some inspiration in your situation. Wear an inspirational tea and be inspired all day. Let's go to Deal to Heal Teas dot my shopify dot com remember our mission is to help you to deal heal and fulfill deal with your problem heal from the pain and fulfill your purpose thanks for listening